we're going to be playing this today. Activision presents a I'll let it run out. Blast from the past. You need to know it's from my Activision. <coughs> Not Naughty Dog. I don't actually know what Beanox did. They ring a bell. Did they work on Guitar Hero or Rock Band or something before? Am I completely wrong? Yeah, so, um. I'm just gonna play this. Maybe just one cup. I don't really want to. Let's play this one. Uh, yeah, we're just gonna just have one cup. I'm just gonna do this as like a kind of like a just some lols. Uh, I'm gonna actually manually pick because I don't like this. Um, hmm. This is a hard. Hard decision, tough decisions uh, being made here. I don't play crunch. I don't really play crunch that often. And I kind of think crunch. I always used to like crunch. Uh, what we got here? Oh, I, I really like this one. I don't like the skin they gave me here. I have this one. We're going to change the paint job so you can see the detailing a little more. So none of these pearlescent, super shiny things. Uh, what we got here? Don't really like that color. Yeah, why not? Stickers. This, you know, the, I'm just, I'm basically showing you all the customizations of this game. Let's have a hamburger. I don't know why. Other than it said I get more points or something for it. So, um, yeah. If we've not mentioned before, like, I was born in 1992, Crash Bandicoot came out in 1994, I think I picked it up in 1996, 7, or my parents more accurately did. So that tells you a lot about, like, my timeline and development. A lot of people I know, they're obsessed with Nintendo, they were, like, raised on Nintendo, and they're like, what, your first car racer wasn't Mario Kart? Because that's like, that's the majority, right? So, <laughs> you know, it is weird coming from such a strange backdoor angle into these kind of games, and like, just basically, You're sure taking your sweet time. basically like, this is nostalgia for me, and it's just really weird for a lot of people. So it's like everyone else associates like um, nostalgia with like saying a little bit more uh, yeah you know like Nintendo really does have like uh, a lot of nostalgia stuff going on for a lot of people and it seems weird for a lot of people to assume that, like, you know, well, you know, everyone has nostalgia for something, right? <clears throat> I don't know why I liked Crunch, though. Crunch is quite late era. There we go. It's kind of annoying me. Uh, yeah, so, um... One of my friends, though, who I always thought was a hardcore Crash Bandicoot game game fan, he was like, oh, no, man, I only ever really played Spyro the Dragon. And that was a bit of a weird kind of like, I thought you were one of us, but you're one of them. But actually, I played both as well. <laughs> like, And I like both. I don't have a favorite. I tried to play Rayman. Now, that's really hard as a kid. If, if you ever played the original Rayman, you know what I'm talking about. Um... Original Rayman, I couldn't get past the music world when I was like seven or eight and trying to play it because it was just like, oh my god, this is such a hard game for like a kid that young. But then, when I was really young, I was playing Crash uh, Bandicoot 1, and there's stuff in that game where I was like, oh yeah, that's easy, I can do this, uh, I can do this um, level really easily. And going back to it as an adult, I couldn't do it. 
and I was kind of embarrassed by that. It's like, you know, a seven-year-old version of me could do this, but, like, now I can barely, like, get around this track or, like, you know, do the motorbike, uh, do the motorbike. I'm just failing here. Not that it matters, I'm still winning. Um, so yeah, like I can just do a lot of these tracks because these tracks didn't change and the controls haven't really changed enough to make it a substantially different game to the classic. And I played this so many times, both when it first came out and the re-release on the PS3 that was not even a remaster, and now this remaster, it means that I know these tracks are at the back of my hand and I can do this in my sleep. So, um, yeah, it's just, you know. You know, if you're thinking about buying this game and you needed a nostalgia boost from uh, this kind of kart racer, because you're always a big fan of CTR, this is a pretty good, um, pretty good faithful uh, recreation of it with a lot of, you know, just more content. Not really sure about this stuff, but like, um, it gives you something to work towards, I guess. I would have preferred something else, like some sort of progression based thing. Uh. Anyway, we're just gonna, we're just going through this, just kind of like showing off all of the cups one by one. Um, yeah, Crunch Man, Crunch Bandicoot. I remember when he first came out, and if you can remember Wrath of Cortex, I actually enjoyed that game quite a lot because after all of the kind of dodgy games in between Naughty Dog owning it. Uh, and that game, and then all of the dodgy games after it, it was kind of nice to have somebody go, hey, why don't we make a Crush Bandicoot game, and it's literally just a platformer with a walk room, like we've always done. Why are we making this kind of like, no, we have to redesign all of the characters, like Twin Sanity and all of this, where they're like trying to make everything different, and like the one where you, the ones where, you know, Crash of the Titans and that, where you're like, beating things up and like riding animals and cheers and it just seems to be like uh, I don't really get why this is a thing I, like I played one of them and I didn't really even finish it because I was just like this isn't really what I wanted um, Twin Sanity was weird I barely remember what happened it was really short you played as Nina I think uh, they redid Tiny Tiger and made him a berry wearing fashionista or something and I think they were like yeah we're subverting expectations and it was like but it was like a one and done and he then just went back to what he always was because everyone was like what happened to tiny tiger and it was like just such a yeah and then he never returned to the plot it's like it would have been more interested if you redesigned or designed a new character that was somehow relevant there was a lot of like um Twin Sanity was just a disappointment, uh, but there's quite a few Crash games post Naughty Dog that, much like the Spyro Trilogy, a lot of disappointments. Um, post, uh, post the original trilogy, these platformers tend to collapse and then they, uh, the guys who buy them don't really know what to do with them and then some, I feel like some exit comes in and goes, why don't we do what's popular now? Everyone wants everything to be edgy and dark. Let's make Spyro edgy and dark. Hey, Shadow the Hedgehog came out. Let's give Crash a gun. No, they didn't do that. But like, um, you know what I mean? I feel like we were two steps away from Crash. You know, they already had him on a motorbike in free. And he does actually fire a rocket launcher in that game. So we already have Crash using guns. Um, but yeah, it just felt like they were just, you know, business exits going, how are we going to make this the next big thing? What do the kids like? And like, Crash went through so many redesigns. I mean, like, I could talk about this for hours. He used to like, obviously his original look is what's the, the one that's endured. But at one point, and like, 
they keep going back and forth on whether or not he's literate and or can speak. And I always love that. <laughs> no idea what they're doing with him. And sometimes they make him quite perverted, <laughs> kind of like obsessed with women, where he's fantasizing about being on beaches with like Torna and stuff and hanging out with his girlfriend, and other times when he's more childlike. And it's kind of a weird thing to retcon, because it's like, what is he, like a gibbering imbecile who just shouts pancakes occasionally? Um, a pervy weirdo? <laughs> like, you know, what, what are we doing here? Um, is he supposed to be like edgy? Like when he came out in the 90s, everything was like, yeah, that's extreme. And he was like very much like everyone who remembers his ad campaign back in the day. Very like trying to make the kids feel like they were like, he's extreme Sonic. He's not lame. And then even Sonic, to be honest, had that cartoon series around that time where there was that one Sonic Underground where they were all in a band and the drummer was green. I actually used to love that drummer. I thought he was hilarious. But I was like, I don't know, four, five, six when I first watched that. So, <laughs> yeah, you, you can really like attract a child's imagination purely by going, look, brightly colored hedgehogs. So, like, you know, <laughs> it could have been trash. I can't remember a single thing that happened. I remember one section where Sonic sneaks out of their house and they're like, oh no, Sonic's there. He's snoring and he's literally hidden <laughs> under the duvet. Um, <laughs> A machine that is just sawing a piece of wood forever to to make a snoring sound and I'm like so Sonic just invented something that broke thermodynamics to sneak out of the house <laughs> can we just get that straight what the fuck was that and like there was like quite I remember watching one Sonic cartoon where like his adoptive parents get turned into horrible robot slaves by like Robotnik and like they're like oh no my adoptive mum and dad they've been cyberized and I remember as a kid that hitting me real hard and being like shit that's real dark man the only people who ever loved him are now like robot mind slaves Man, 90s cartoons hit real hard, and they hit, like, hard and fast, and then they were just thrown in the trash, like, oh, he's got to beat Robotnik now, and I'd never watched it to, like, because back in those days, cartoons didn't run in order. You'd watch one, and then you'd tune in, like, two weeks from then, and it'd be, like, the first episode again, and you'd be like, wait, what? And you couldn't follow it. There was no coherent storyline in British TV, so you'd be watching Pokemon, and they'd be like, Hey, this is just one of those kids shows. They don't know continuity or character arcs or something. We'll just put them in a whatever order we receive them from Japan or whatever we find them in the order in our archive. And they would just rerun them in a completely random order. One day you'd be like, especially Pokemon, oh, I'm about to go face Giovanni, guys, back in the original, you know, run. Hey guys, I'm gonna go fight Team Rocket. Then the next time you'd be back in fucking Pallet Town, it'd be Professor Oak being like, Hey man, you wanna choose your first Pokemon already? I wanna go fuck your mom. And you'd just be like, Oh Jesus. <laughs> like, what happened? It's like, you know, adding this weird time travel element to everything. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, Professor Oak was totally doing that. We all know that. It's like a constant joke has now seeped just into my acceptance of that's probably what was happening. <laughs> Which is real messed up. <laughs> but like, there's a lot of like, adult undercurrent in 90s kids cartoons, so can you see why like, most like, millennials are now really like, <laughs> cynical, like, and like, you know, low-key just think everyone's doing things for their own thing, because it's like, <laughs> for their own like, uh, benefit, because it's like, there's, there's always like this, like, like I remember, like, like I mentioned that, and like, I think Street Sharks did it as well, and Biker Mice from Mars were trying so hard to be edgy, they'd be like, yeah, our token thing is that we drink root beer, we can't drink real beer, because we're aimed at kids, <laughs> and I was just like, yeah, that's, that's great, guys, bikers who drink root beer, so fucking edgy, <laughs> like, you know. Imagine being a real-life biker and being around your mates and be like, yeah, I'll just have a root beer now. <laughs> you know, they'd probably be like, um... I mean, it's, it's ballsy in a different way. <laughs> 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 
But anyway, I don't remember if Crash ever had a cartoon run. If it did, I never watched it. That would have been funny. Back in the day, I would have watched the shit out of that. I was a Crash Bandicoot fanboy. But like, like I've said before, I was like... My childhood was mostly in Germany and Cyprus, and I don't know if that affected anything, but it might have meant availability of certain consoles was not available, you know, certain things. Like, I never really saw anyone rocking a Nintendo in Cyprus. Some guys had the Sega Genesis, if they were older, or the Saturn. Uh, some guys even had a Mega Drive by the end of it. Like, one of my friends, childhood friends, had a Mega Drive, and we used to play Streets of Rage and Ninja Gaiden, and, um... I used to just be like, cool, this ninja game's cool, how do I win? Oh, I keep dying, and they'd be like, refuse to play with me after a while, because they're like, wow, you suck at these games, and like, uh, Streets of Rage 2, stop hitting me, which one are you? I'm the big, muscly guy, <laughs> like, the guy that doesn't look like any of the other characters on the screen. Oh, I thought you were a boss. Stop making me drop the knife, now it's faded away, you know, we just, just have these arguments, and then you just start beating the shit out of me until I like, game over so you could go on and play the game without me. That was how much how bad I was. Um, someone, one of my f old friends from Germany's older brother had, I think, a Dreamcast and DuckTales. And I watched him play that and he got stuck on a level in front of me and he was super embarrassed. And he was like, oh, fuck, man. Oh, jeez. And he was like 15, 16, 17 at the time. And I was like 10. I was like, Oh man, this place is cool. And he got stuck in like a tomb level in front of me and was like, fuck. <laughs> and it was just like, because he was trying to be like, oh yeah, this game's really cool. You should check out this game. Oh shit, like I'm like 16 and I got stuck on a fucking DuckTales level in front of this 10 year old. <laughs> oh man yeah like I played Echo the Dolphin around a friend's house and I was like oh this is okay it was actually like uh, she was a girl and she was like really into dolphins at this time she had dolphin t-shirts and dolphin everything and she was really nice like she was one of my best friends at the time way back in primary school then we lost contact but, like, uh, she loved dolphins, and she was, like, Echo the Dolphin all the way, but she also had Sonic the Hedgehog 1, Streets of Rage 2, and then, like, um, yeah, it's just crazy how you experience these games. It's mostly that like all of your mates, back in those days, everyone had a different console, but it was all local, and I sound like... <laughs> sound like a, an old man. Back in those days, we didn't have the internet, but legit. One of my friends was still doing the thing of, hey, I want to go on the internet and download new, like, ringtones for my Nokia 3410. Dad, can I unplug the landline? And he'd be like, no. <laughs> like, you know? And we'd be like, we can't look at funny junk now. <laughs> what you got on your PS1? And then he just put Ministry of Sound videos, which is super inappropriate if you've ever watched Mini Ministry of Sound. Um... He just have these running all, all the time in the background. He was a big fan of the Need for Speed Underground series. He was really big into tuning, and he was, like, basically, like, The Fast and the Furious was his Bible. And then Too Fast, Too Furious came out, and he was like, oh, my God, man, these guys are amazing. And then Tokyo Drift came out, and he was like, eh. <laughs> you know, and I like Tokyo Drift. But, like, um, he was just, yeah, like, where's Vin Diesel gone? As a lot of people. And where's Paul Walker? And, like, he, like, when you're 12, Ministry of Sound videos, especially the ones, like, um, oh, like, virtually all of them were just girls doing, like, I remember Eric Pridd's videos, or Pride's, Pridd's videos, being just clips of Pink Floyd and other, like, guys, samples mixed in with his own music, which wasn't that memorable, personally. Sorry, Eric Pridd's fans. But, like, I remember super hard him just leaving them. And there's a 12-year-old who's just worked out and just going through puberty slowly and is just working out girls. Seeing girls in yoga pants and girls in construction gear. <laughs> Basically a hard hat and a bikini using a drill and stuff. You were just like, what am I looking at? And he'd be like, yeah, it's cool. It's cool. And you were just like... 
but why is the music video just this? And it's like, because everyone wants to look at the lady, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> like, you know, I was never a big fan of that stuff, to be honest. Like, I mean, back in that time, I was just discovering the Chili Peppers and The Cure for the first time, so I was starting to get into hard rock after spending a lot of my time in glam rock, because that's where I started listening to music. They did change his win animation, and I only remember that because in Crash Nitro Kart, he used to just flex really hard and be like, yeah! So they did change his win animation. Pointless facts. Anyway, um, I never really listened to that kind of music personally. I kind of got into retrowave and vaporwave and synthwave kind of stuff recently. Just as something to listen to when I'm trying to chill out. We'll do one more, because I'm kind of in there now. <laughs> Let's mix it up. Uh, sorry, I have a cold. <laughs> I'm not just some weirdo. Um, Let's do the Lost ones, because the Lost ones are quite entertaining, because the first two aren't technically Lost, they were bundled in the games they came from. Clockwork Wumper was in um, Nitro Car, it just didn't feature in any of these, uh, it was the odd one out. Oxide Station was in TTR as the boss track, you could time trial it, you could play it as a, in local competitive stuff. It just didn't go into the cup I just did. As you can see, weird that they went hard track, hard track, hard track, like the hardest track space at the end of the game. Then, oh, shouldn't this be the final boss track? No, here's a random tarmac track that's a bonus track. Because I think someone told me back in the day, they might have been wrong. It was the 90s, everyone was wrong. Um, that they ran out of uh, data on the disc or they couldn't get the AI to pay attention properly for some reason on the cup but now they just shoved it in the lost thing. The bottom two I think I read somewhere were actual concept art that they also ran out of data and you'll see why for Twilight Tour and Prehistoric Playground the scenes, the, the track side stuff that's going on is just way too complex for a PlayStation 1 to be doing or even the PS2 I think satisfactorily we're just going to stick with crunch so I can keep talking. So yeah, way back in the day, when I, that was, when I was 10, 11, 12, I thought to myself, I only just see what music is, and I just went through my parents' CD collection, and they used to have vinyls, and they lost all their vinyls, or sold all their vinyls, and just gave up on music, but like, my parents, one of my parents was a goth, the other one was an old biker, he used to do, go to like, Monsters of Rock when they first came out, he saw Dio live there, and like, Iron Maiden. So uh, I just went through their stuff, and I went through a lot of goth stuff, like The Cure, uh, I went through The Cult. First things I really picked up were, I, kind of embarrassingly, Def Leppard, and then not as embarrassingly, Guns N' Roses. And it was just Greatest Hits compilation, so I was just going through all their Greatest Hits going, and listening to them religiously. Um, but like, I basically spent most of my teen years uh, reliving my parents' music without being aware that it was my parents' music, because, like, they only had a few CDs in the house, because uh, they lost all of their music or just stopped caring about music after a while. I started to rediscover stuff, and I was listening to stuff like the Chili Peppers, which was on the radio when I was a kid in the 90s, because that was when Under the Bridge got real big. And, um... Uh, I started listening to King Crimson, and I remember, I have a vague memory of when I was a kid sleeping in the car on a long-term road trip while my parents were listening to things like Cream and King Crimson and stuff, but I'm not sure if that's actually like a mis-memory, because that was like when I must have been like two or something. Anyway. I remember those old days with the consoles and stuff, like, um, one of my friends that had, um, like I said, each of my friends had a different thing. One of my friends had an N64, the other person had... Like, it was weird because we'd also have different generations of consoles. There was no, like, pressure to update, and each of my friends' families had different income. So, like, they would just go, oh, I have an N64. Oh, I have, like, a um, uh, Sega Mas Sega Mega Drive or something. And then, like, um... 
someone else would have like a Saturn and like, I'd have a PS1, then I'd get a PS2 and half of my friends would just have a PS1 still. And it was just like, that meant that we all discovered different games at different times. I'd have a PS2 and my friend uh, I'd stay over with at school sometimes. Uh, my friend from school who I used to stay over with sometimes when uh, I was being childminded by his mum had a PS1, but he had a load of really aggressive and violent games that I wasn't allowed to play because we were still in primary school. And like, that was, this isn't a violent game. I guess it has blood in it, but it was the first time I read, I played Tony Hawk's Pro Skater, and it was the first time I um, played the WWE 90, you know, the, the old, um, the really good wrestling games that, that came out of those times. And that was kind of actually my first time even looking at wrestling was through the video game. And the first time I even considered skateboarding as a thing was through the video games. Because I didn't, I didn't skate. I tried to skate. I've even bought a skateboard around this time. Piece of shit, like 20 pound as the skateboard. Because I was like, oh yeah, I'm not going to bother to learn. I went on it once on an uneven patio. I fell off immediately and slammed my leg into like a terracotta, like my knee into like heavy patio edging. Like smashed my knee on it. Obviously in pain. And then I was just like, I'm not touching the skateboard again. Ended up giving it to one of my friends. And they were like, oh cool, you give me a skateboard. And then they did exactly the same thing and sold it to somebody else. Uh, like, uh, yeah, we just kept passing this one as the price skateboard around because we're all like, yeah, we're going to be like Tony Hawk, bro. They get down the street, fall over, smash their leg on something blunt and go, oh, fuck this. <laughs> it's a great time. It was a great time in the 90s and the aughts. <laughs> That's what people were doing. I'm going to be like Tony Hawk, bang. No, I'm not. <laughs> Because, like, a lot of this suburbia as well didn't have it. In Britain, there's not a lot of skate parks and everywhere. And um, we would have all been too chicken shit to do it. So we were just, you know, on the, on the pavement. And then, like, in suburbia, in, like, a close where there would be, like, a cul-de-sac-style place where there's just no cars because it's, like, Saturday afternoon. <laughs> and everyone sat at home just watching the TV and stuff. And, um... We'd be trying to do this shit while the rest of us are on our like busted ass, like five year old uh, mountain bikes going, hey, hey, guy, try and do a jump. And we'd be like, I can't even stand on the board. It's like, do a jump, do a jump. <laughs> and, you've, and then like one of us could maybe like jump it up the side of the cover. We're like, yeah, it's, just, like, it's so pathetic. <laughs> oh, I remember one time I. I <laughs> Yeah, like, that was always funny. Uh, and we, like, just do stuff like that. It was a weird time, my youth. It was a time of, like, like early youth before teen years. I try to get into, like, about a hundred things, and that's always been my personality, where it's like, I try to enjoy football, because soccer is called football in the UK, obviously. But also, uh, it's, like really popular so I watched like one World Cup and was like all my friends are into it so I was like yeah I'm really into football and then I had a long hard talk with myself and went I fucking hate football <laughs> you know and it's just like I, ever since I've never really watched it I've had other people watch it and I've just sat there in my corner gone going yeah if it's on I'll let you guys watch it I'm not gonna have a comment I have no opinion it's just like I don't know anything about the sport like, I'm just watching it, and I'm like, they're kicking the ball up and down, and everyone's getting excited. But, like, it's just like, I prefer to watch um, rugby myself. Anyway, um, yeah, we tried a lot of stuff, and we did a lot of weird, like, weird stuff, because back in the 90s, everything had to be extreme. So we got into some really weird shit where we were, like, um, trying to skateboard, failing, one of our friends had GTA, so they thought they were gangster. Uh, we were all trying to be really cool, but failing. One of our friends worked out that if you put a lighted match underneath a um, aerosol can, you can set fire to it and make a flamethrower. So we were like, cool, man. And then everyone said, someone told our headmaster, and then they had a lot. 
<laughs> a long ass talk with us about how that's dangerous and we shouldn't do it. And me being the dumbass that I, <laughs> that I was, one of my friends was looking at me pointedly like, yeah, Jake. And I would just be like, and I said to him loudly in front of everyone, why are you looking at me? And then everyone was just like, <laughs> looking at me. And I was like, really embarrassed. <laughs> I, was like, I don't do that. Shut up. But one of my friends uh, stole candy from one of us teachers. I like, stole like a twirl, no, a curly whirly from our teacher. And our teacher stopped us all and was like, who stole it? You're not leaving until you tell us. And no one owned up to it. And everyone was like, oh, yeah, it was this guy. And this guy was like my kind of like kind of friend. He was a friend of a friend. I didn't know him that well, but actually I did know that he stole all the time. He stole Pokemon cards and got Pokemon cards banned from our school because too many people lost the cards. Um, yeah, and like he was stealing like all of those collectible 90s things. And I was just like, nah, I don't think that guy stole it, you know. Nah, he wouldn't ever do that. And I was like defending him so hardly, so like heavily and defiantly that everyone was like, nah, he didn't do it. And then we got out, and he was like, yeah, do you want some? And I was like, you fucking bastard. <laughs> like, I actually believed you. <laughs> what an asshole. But we did all sorts of, like, delinquent shit at a really young age. And I think it meant when I went to secondary school, I was weirdly tame. Even though I was listening to, like, kind of heavy music, I was listening to, like, grandpa heavy music by comparison. Because back in the... Around the time I went to secondary school, GTA San Andreas came out and, like, Vice City was come out in the early years and San Andreas in, like, year five of our, like, secondary school or something. And, um, everyone was like, yeah, it's cool if you're white middle class to pretend you're black. <laughs> you know, everyone's like, yeah, I'm fucking cool. I listen to all of this, like, gangster rap shit. And I was just like... Uh, okay, yeah, I can see why you guys like that. I see why you, you think, you know, because the San Andreas and stuff. But I just listened to all this music and I became really unpopular really quickly because I was listening to stuff that was like, that's what my parents listened to, man. Guns N' Roses is not edgy anymore. And like, I was just like, I don't give a shit, sounds cool. And I started learning guitar around that time. And I started listening to really heavy metal. And it's funny because kids want to be edgy. This is one of the actually lost stages. Um... Kids want to be edgy, right? But they want to be edgy in a way that they're accepted by their peers. There is an acceptable way to be edgy, and heavy metal's too out there and too, like, of a certain time period in a lot of popular conceptions brain that if you try and, like, say to people, yeah, I'm probably edgier than you because I listen to things where everyone's talking about murdering each other all of the time, or at least semi-regularly, they're like, Oh yeah, but it's not cool because it's not about like this shit and like it's just like dude You're never gonna be cool like that because you're not 50 cent. You're like a boy named Howard <laughs> from like a wealthy family Whose parents are both doctors? <laughs> so it's like dude, you're about as gangster as like you're less gangster than I am <laughs> Yeah, it was a weird time uh but yeah, like actually, uh, in my uh, at the end of my primary school, it was weirdly delinquent. Like a lot of my friends were like trying to act cool, but didn't know what they were saying. So they were, like, yeah, I think that girl's fit, but they didn't know what it meant. <laughs> and um, like you know, some of my friends would be breaking bottles and stuff, and like I would always be stood around, and then they get caught when I was stood near them, and like it was like they weren't drinking or anything. They found empties on the floor that someone had just dumped from like drunk being drunk the night before and they'd smash them and go yeah and then like someone would say to them like an older person like an adult would say to them uh are you gonna put that away that's like dangerous now and they'd be like yeah okay <laughs> they just fly away so yeah i'll do it i'll do it and then they wait for them to go away so like, i'm not gonna do it i'm so edgy <laughs> that was a weird time man weird time in my life I learned a lot through video games. I was never really big into comic books until I played the Spider-Man PS1 game. 
And then I was like, oh, these characters are cool. And I kind of know, because everyone kind of knows who Spider-Man is. And then the Spider-Man films came out. I didn't watch the first one. I watched, like, the second one, the second Sam Raimi film in the theaters. And at the time, it blew my mind. I was like, oh, my God, Spider-Man's so cool. I could be Tobey Maguire. <laughs> And then the game came out and was pretty good and I played that way too much. And now I look at it and look at gameplay of it and I'm like, oh my god, this is terrible. <laughs> like, like, you know, for the time it was really good. The swing mechanics are really good, but it's like, you know, now? It doesn't really hold up, unfortunately. And a lot of the missions were, hey man, swing across the city in time, <laughs> otherwise MJ will leave you. They're like, oh, I'm getting fed up of dealing with MJ, giving me like 15 seconds to cross the street, to cross the entire city of New York. I mean, what the hell, man? <laughs> you know, you think if she doesn't know I'm Spider-Man, she knows it's going to take some time because traffic, right? <laughs> like, you know? I genuinely used to get triggered by those and the pizza delivery missions. I was like, if you're not Spider-Man, how are you actually supposed to deliver pizza on time in New York? <laughs> Like, you know, I'm taking, like, the fastest route possible here. I'm fucking Spider-Man. <laughs> like, you know, so what about the guys who aren't Spider-Man? Are they all fired regularly? <laughs> Jeez. The plight of the delivery men in New York. <laughs> yeah, that, that was a weird time in my life. It's a weird time when my friend would be like, yeah, let's go pimp some rides on Need for Speed Underground, then we're going to play GA San Andreas, and look, I, I managed to, like, do this thing on my phone where I did, like, the theme tune to, like, this film I barely even knew about on my phone. Yeah, I'm so cool, I'm so gangster, later we're going to go out on our bikes, and we're going to go check out like, my next-door neighbor, because she's kind of hot, and then, like, his mum would call and say, Hey boys, dinner's ready. We go down and just eat like oven baked pizza. <laughs> look, yeah, we're so cool. <laughs> you, when you look back at what you're like as a fucking kid, <laughs> you're like, yeah, I'm cool. <laughs> like, you know, just like. <laughs> yeah, I'm really cool, guys. And then, like, oh yeah, we're gonna play Tekken later. <laughs> oh yeah, we're gonna play Tekken and beat each other up because we're so hardcore. Yeah, we're gonna be. Oh, your mum brought us big well tarts. Oh yeah, Mr. Kipling. <laughs> yeah, we're cool. <laughs> no, I won't play that dance mat game or your like, all that sing star game or the karaoke games. I'm I I gotta like respect level, you know. Ooh, sausage rolls. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that was a good time in my life. That was a good time. Uh, yeah, like, I could just talk about old cartoons I watched about three episodes of and was just like, and then they got taken off of British TV. Because <laughs> no one was watching them. Digimon. I watched Digimon, and I like, watched two episodes of Digimon, and one of them was the beginning where they're like, look, it's Agumon, and I was like, wow, it's Ugly Charmander. Because <laughs> I was like a Pokemon diehard. People don't realize how that shit hit. Everyone was like, it's just a fad, the parents were saying. But people were like, like I said, stealing cards off of one another. I lost my dark, shiny Gyarados, my shiny Zapdos, and um, <clears throat> uh, I think one of my, sh my shiny Moltres and my dark Weezing. I love Weezing. If I ever do a Pokemon LP, which, I mean, they're all on my DS, so um, probably not. I do a lot of Poison team builds, so you, you, you kind of get a wheezing on your poison team a lot of the time. They're good tanks. Um, <clears throat> and also, he levitates, so that stops ground from being a problem. Anyway, um, that, that was much later. I wasn't doing that when I was like seven. I wasn't even playing the trading card game, I was just getting the cards. And uh, <clears throat> I lost those, and people were like going crazy. This was back in the day where you could bring a Game Boy Color because there was no rules about portable consoles. Because no one had portable consoles back in the day. Like, that was a new thing. Um, like, a really new thing. No one had portable consoles. And I brought my Game Boy in, and one of my friends bought 
their Game Boy Color in, and then a load of people did. And then some guys got upset because they traded Pokemon with each other. It's like, oh, I traded you that Pokemon. And, like, they traded their starter for this guy, and then he just ran off and was like, I'm not giving you back your starter. And they, he was, like, crying and shit. It was a real dank uh, back in those days because people were, like, kids are assholes, man. I remember getting in a fist fight with one guy over a Beyblade. But, <laughs> man, <laughs> legit things that happened in the 90s. We were playing Beyblade, and I had Master Dragoon, so shut the fuck up. And he had, like, I don't know, I think he had, like, what was it, um, Dronza, the blue one? Or did he have Black Dronza? And he was like, yeah, I'm cooler than you. I got Black Dronza. And then, like, mine got stuck, and I lost our match, and I got so annoyed, <laughs> I punched him in the face. And then the principal was like, you know, the the, <clears throat> the head teacher took me to one side. I was like, you know, it's only a game, right? And I was like, you're so, I'm so sorry, don't, don't worry. And back in those days, every time I got in trouble, I was like, oh my god, this is going on my record. And they literally would say, this is going on your record. Not saying that, that that's what a thing head teachers used to say to us. This is going on your record, your school record. No, they wouldn't say school record, and you're like, oh my god, I have a police record. Because <laughs> I punched someone over a Beyblade. <laughs> that was, those were good times. Hilarious times. Beyblade, man. <laughs> oh, man, that, yeah. Oh, oh dude, uh, yeah. Thinking about what I was like as like a really young kid, I was just like, everyone else is trying to be gangster, and you'd be like, dude, you're not cool, <laughs> and they'd be like, shut up, <laughs> like, you know, everyone wanted to be really hardcore, but they were like, because we're like seven, or like we're like getting up to like 16 and stuff when we were in secondary school, everyone was trying to be really cool, but it's like, you live with your middle class ass mum in suburbia, so like, you don't, you know, it's not like you're from the ghetto. <laughs> I mean, I went to a school where there was a lot of, like, um, around that time a lot of people were inspired to have fights and get violent and stuff because of those kind of games. And because it was just like everyone was playing it, and they were like, yeah, I'm in a gang. And they were even building gangs, going, yeah, we're cool, we're cool. And they would, like, try and rap together and stuff, and it was really cringy because it'd be, like, like, one black guy and, like, five middle-class white guys, and they'd be like, yeah, 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 and they'd be in a school uniform, <laughs> and they'd be like, yeah, we're cool, we're cool, yeah, we're, we're cool, we're, we're gonna give you beats, man, meet me in the play courts later, and you'd be like, just, you wouldn't show up, <laughs> and they'd be like, be pussy down, man, <laughs> so, no, because all the PE teachers would just find out and just sit there and go, if you start a fight, we're gonna put you in a headlock and take you to the principal, so... <laughs> And, like, everyone was getting really, like, and one guy snuck a knife into my school, and they, like, nowadays you hear this happening all the time, even at really prestigious schools. I worked at a school as a literature teacher at a prestigious Hong Kong school, and one of the kids in primary six, who I was quite good friends with, was like, hey, you right, man? I was like, oh, hey, dude, how's things? He's like, caught a kid with a flick knife today. He was in P1, primary one. Caught a kid today, and he had a flick knife on him because he was a hall monitor. I was like, whoa, and he was like, yeah, so it wasn't that bad, but like in my primary, no, not my, not my primary, but uh, uh, my secondary, like year five of secondary, a guy brought a knife and was like, yo, I got a knife, I'm so fucking cool, you know, like people were like using lighters and shit and trying to set people, I had my hair set on fire when I had long hair uh, in an English class, because the teacher turned her back for five seconds and this guy just went, and I set fire to his hair. And, like, I remember everyone freaking the fuck out about it at the time. And me just sitting there going, oh, this stinks. And then they're like, you can go home if you want. I'm like, oh, okay. And there was only one extra lesson. It was, like, my art lesson. So I was just like, yeah, I'll go home. And I just went in and was like, hey. And they were like, hey. And, my, like, my dad was working at home at the time. Uh, and I was like, hey. And he was like, Hey, I, I said, I'm going to go get a shower. And he's like, okay. I had a shower and came back down. He said, so you're going to talk about what happened? And I was like, 
Uh, yeah, that happened, and I just didn't give a shit, because it didn't burn me, because my hair used to be, like, Robert Plant level, like, down my back level. So it didn't reach my head in time before someone put it out. I didn't even notice. And, um, everyone was freaking out, and I was just out of like, dude, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> but, yeah, that was, like, the worst it ever got, and we used to think we were edgy, for doing shit like that, and like people were shoving each other into lockers and having fights and shit, and like lockers would fall over and they'd be like, because they weren't bolted to the wall in those days or at that school, and everyone would be like, fuck, that made a loud noise and all of the teachers would come, but like no one ever, like people fought each other, there's any of the really violent kids that actually knocked each other out, and that was like, only happened twice I think when I was at school, <laughs> and now being a teacher, I can tell you, like, the, the stonks of violence in the kin in the, in the kindergartens, <laughs> not in the kindergartens, in the um, schools has just raised really high. Like, even in prestigious, like, primaries and, like, really, like, um, it's actually worse the wealthier the kid is. And they get, like, the really wealthy places seem to have way more problems with this. I probably shouldn't be talking about this, but, like... <laughs> I mean, I'm not naming names and saying which school I used to work at, but, like, um, you know, it's easy to, like, anyway, um, I remember everyone used to think they were being really edgy for bringing a knife into school, but, like, if they brought a knife into school, they were just suspended. One kid got straight up, got full-on expelled. There were twins in my school, and, like, um, one of the twins got expelled, but the other one was allowed to stay, and, like, then the other one nearly got expelled because they were both really bad, and, like, this guy got expelled and he showed up the next day just as a power move. I was like, yeah, you can't stop me. <laughs> and then he never came back again. Because they were like, yes, we can stop you. If you come back, we'll call the police. Because you aren't paying tuition. <laughs> or like, you're not registered with a school. Go to a real school. You need to be like, because you're at that age where it's mandatory, right? So you have to go to a school. <laughs> um, yeah. I forget what he did. I think he like, beat up a kid or something. There was a lot of these kind of problems. Um, but like, um, you know, it feels like we thought we were edgy at the time because you're talking late 90s, probably like actually hitting like 2006 to 2009. I started secondary in 2003. And um, we thought we were being really cool, but you got to think it was aughts. And we were like, oh yeah, Limp Biscuits cool kind of thing. So, you know, it was like... We thought we were being edgy, but I feel like the stakes have been raised as years have gone by, and now what we thought we was edgy and cool, it was nuanced kind of back then. Kinda? I mean, any dodgy inner city school or something, you're gonna have these things happening, but like, I remember, anyway, I should cut this anecdote short. And now I'm gonna move on.